Acts chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogue of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goad. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. They led him by the hand and brought him into, into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I'll stop there for just a moment. You know, a lot of times, I'm sure you've heard over the years that old expression, nothing surprises me anymore. And I've made that statement many, many times in my life. I, I mean, even recently I've made the statement, boy, nothing surprises me anymore. And then the next day, Something comes along and it surprises me. In fact, here lately, not only does it surprise me, it shocks me. I'm amazed at some of the things that I see and hear. Did you know there's an actual top ten list? You can actual, actually Google this on the, on, the inter, uh, on the Internet of the top ten things that's happened in our lifetime that's supposed to be just absolutely amazing. And so I was looking at that list the other day, and I was shocked at what they say are the top ten things that's happened in all of history. And I looked at them, and I was amazed. And I want to share the top ten things that's happened in history, and you're going to be shocked at what made the top ten list. You're going to be amazed at what made the list at all. And you're going to be really shocked at what didn't even make the list. So here are the top ten things, amazing things that has happened in the history of the world. And this is the order in which they say was simply amazing. Number one, the signing of the U.S. Constitution. That made the number one thing, the most amazing thing ever to happen in the history of the world. Number two was World War I and World War II. Number three 
was the assassination of Julius Caesar. And number four, the invention, invention of the printing press. Number five, I like this one, the invention of an airplane. Number six, the Declaration of Independence. And number seven, the invention of gunpowder. We like that here in the South, amen. Number eight, the discovery of the Western Hemisphere. Number nine, the death of Jesus. And number ten, the death of Mohammed. The ten greatest things ever in the history of the world. I read it the other day and I thought, well, praise the Lord, at least Jesus made the list. <laughs> Number nine. Well, I want to submit to you that list is badly flawed. Because I think some of the greatest events in all of the world didn't even make it on the list. In fact, Four of the greatest things that's ever happened in the history of the world can be found in the first four books of the New Testament. So I want to give you my top four of events that's happened in the events of the world that I believe should have made the list but didn't make the list at all. Number one should have been the death of Jesus. Amen. Thank God for the death of Jesus because... That was important. You agree? But then number two should have been the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That not only is the greatest event in history, but I believe it is the greatest event in the universe. It is the greatest event in all of the Bible. The third greatest event, I believe, in what should have been coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Wow, what an event. What a glorious moment when the fire from heaven came down. And think about it like this. That fire still been burning now for 2,017 years. In fact, in a lot of ways, that fire is burning even brighter today. Do you agree with that? Thank God for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The fourth thing that would have made my list that's not on the top ten list, but is something I want us to look at today. It revolves around a man who was actually set on fire in the year 33 A.D. In fact, because of what happened to that one man is the reason you and I are here today. The things that happened to that man even affects us today. Now, the last several weeks we've been studying from the wonderful book of the book of Acts, and so far we have looked at a church on fire, and we've seen a church under fire, and then last Sunday we looked at a church that fights fire with fire. Remember that last Sunday morning? Question. What does an individual look like that's been set on fire by the Holy Spirit? Have you been set on fire by the Holy Spirit? What does an individual look like who has truly received the Holy Spirit? What does a man or woman look like that has truly been set on fire by the Holy Spirit? See, my, my fourth greatest event of all time, I would call it the conversion of Saul. The conversion of the Apostle Paul. It would not be short of the mark to say that of all the conversions that's ever taken place in the history of the world, the, the greatest of all time would have been the Apostle Paul. We call it the Damascus Road experience. It's the story of how a man was set on fire by the Holy Spirit. And watch this. What happened in this man's life, it affected the entire New Testament. What happened to this man on that day even affects the church, the bride of Christ, even to this very 
day. Let me tell you how important Paul's conversion was. Did you know when it comes to the story of Paul's conversion, it is actually told or repeated three times in the book of Acts alone. Did you know that the conversion of the Apostle Paul actually occupies more space in the New Testament than any other recorded event except the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Why is there so much devoted to one man? Why do we find so much in the Scripture about the conversion of one individual? I find it extremely significant that in one short book, one man's salvation is given so much attention. It's really not surprising, I think, when you understand that the two greatest events in the history of the world that followed the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ was the coming of the Holy Spirit and the conversion of the Apostle Paul. So why is his, converge, his conversion, why is it such a history-changing, life-impacting, spiritually transforming event? Well, perhaps the greatest analogy, the greatest way for me to explain Paul's conversion would be like this. What do you think would have happened, the year would have been 1944, if every major paper, newspaper around the world in 1944, what do you think the reaction would have been if in black bold letters, every newspaper one morning would have said, Hitler converts to Judaism? The world would have been shocked. I mean, the world would have said, What? You're kidding. The man who tried to wipe out the Jews now converts to Judaism. Wow, that would have been shocking. Can you imagine... The headlines in the Damascus paper. The headlines in the Jerusalem Gazette. When it said, Saul of Tarsus converts to Christianity. <laughs> Can you imagine? Wow. What was going on through the, in the minds of the people? Paul, let me remind you, at the moment, at the time of his salvation, he was the least likeliest person on earth to have been converted to Christianity. Let me remind you something. He was Jewish by birth. He was a Pharisee. He was a Hebrew. He was Greek by learning. He was, a Rome, he was a Roman by citizenship. Think about that. The most immovable object whose heart could not, would not budge one inch. Wanted to destroy Christians. Could not stand Christ. One day, walking down the Damascus Road, minding his own business, headed to kill Christians or at least bind them and have them put in jail, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this man has an encounter with an irresistible force. What was that irresistible force? Jesus. The very one that he wanted to stop dead in his tracks. Saul had an encounter with Jesus. 
Now the man who wanted to put the fire of Jesus out becomes a man who's on fire. <laughs> now here is a man that is on fire for Jesus. I want to ask you a question. I'm not asking you to answer out loud, but you need to answer this in your heart. Every one of us. Is your Christian faith this morning a raging fire or a dull habit? Is my Christian faith, is it a raging fire or is it a dull habit? I want us to see this morning the things about Paul's converge, his conversion that created a raging fire in his heart and in his bones. Because let me tell you something. And I say this with love, but I speak this from the bottom of my heart. If you've ever met the real Jesus that Saul met, you'll be just like him. You'll be on fire. There will be a raging fire in the depths of your heart. Wow. I've heard it said before that Paul or Saul had a conversion experience like no one ever has experienced. I had a man to me one time say, Pastor, you know, and you got to admit, preacher, Saul had something happen to him that you or I didn't have happen. I said, really? What was that? Well, preacher, he saw a divine light. He was struck by light from heaven. He was actually knocked down to the ground when all of a sudden that man heard a voice from heaven. It called him by name. Can I tell you something? If you've ever met the master, then you too have had an experience much like that of Saul. Let me tell you something now. Listen to me. Here's what's going to get a lot of folk in trouble one day. Too many folks have had a religious experience and they've really never met the master. That's why Jesus said in that day, many are going to say, but Lord, Lord, Listen to me, I'm going to go ahead and just get this out on the table right now. Religion will not get you to heaven. What kind of experience did Saul have? What really happened to Saul that day on the Damascus road? Now watch this. Here's what happened to Saul, and if you've ever met Jesus, the same thing has happened to you. What will happen to us when we meet the Master? First and foremost, we will see the light of God's truth. We will see the light of God's truth. Look back to verse 1 and 2. Acts 9 says, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked, letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any one who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Well, to put this in context here that is written, the first time that Paul is actually mentioned, his name was Saul. Remember, he was a witness of the stoning of Stephen. Remember that. Saul was an eyewitness to the stoning of Stephen, who is the martyr of the first, the first martyr of the Christian church. We stood the other day at the gate, just outside the gate where Stephen was stoned. 
Saul was there, and he was an eyewitness of that stoning. And listen to what he says. It's in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Listen to what Saul said about that stoning. Acts 8, verse 1 says, And Saul approved of his execution. Paul was in approval. He was in agreement with the stoning of Stephen. Why? Because he was a believer. Because he was a Christian. And Saul wanted to stamp out Christianity. Well, now we're abruptly introduced to Saul again. And this time, old Saul, his blood is boiling. His blood pressure is going out of the top of his head. He's on a 150-mile journey from Jerusalem to Damascus with one purpose. He had one thought in his mind, only one intent in his heart. He wanted to once and for all get rid of Christianity. He wanted to literally wipe Christians off the face of the earth. The scripture says this, he was so angry, the Bible says, he was breathing murder. In other words, as he made his way towards Damascus, Paul was saying this, I'm sick of these Christians. I'm sick of their preaching. I'm sick of their teaching. I'm going to wipe them out once and for all. That's what it means. I like to think of it like this. Saul was proud of the fact that he had become a Jewish hitman. <laughs> he was proud of the fact that he wanted to wipe them out, wipe out Christianity. But did you notice something as I was reading from that text a moment ago? Did you know that notice what Christianity was referred to in these few verses of Scripture? Christianity is just simply referred to here as the way. The way. Why do you suppose they referred to Christians as the way? Could it be they referred to Christianity as the way because Jesus declared he was the only way to heaven? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Well, Paul was determined that that way was going to be on a dead-end street. That the way was about to come to an end. When suddenly, out of nowhere, something happened. In a flash. I mean in a moment. Something came to Saul that not only changed Saul's life, but the entire course of human history. Amen, church. Look at chapter 9, verse 3. Verse 3 says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Get this. All of a sudden, without any warning, Saul is bathed with a sun, S-O-N, light that was brighter than the sun, S-U-N, light. <laughs> Woo! Now, that really ought not surprise us because Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Let me tell you something, church. It wasn't what Paul saw that day. Rather, it's what he heard that changed his life. What did he hear? Look at verse 4 and 5 again. It says, and he fell to the ground... And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But it's hard for you to kick against the goat. There's a few things there that 
I don't want you to miss. Here's the thing. Watch this. Keep this thought in mind. Paul had never met Jesus before. He had never had a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with the man called Jesus. All Paul knew was he hated him. All Paul knew was he hated those that followed him. And yet, for this man to have never met him, never seen him face to face, never heard his voice, What did he say in verse 5? What did Saul say in verse 5? He called him what? Lord. Never met him. Wanted to destroy Christianity. Hated Christ. And yet, when a holy God showed up, oh, listen, church, when Jesus showed up, Paul's on the ground, and the first thing out of his mouth, Lord, Lord, I have to believe that as he's blinded and he's lying there on that ground, on that road to Damascus, I just have to believe that this probably flashed through his mind. Wow, Jesus is not dead. He's not in a tomb somewhere. He is the risen Lord. <laughs> I want to remind this church, over the last four or five weeks that we've been studying the book of Acts, we've seen it over and over and over again. And the thing that keeps jumping out is all through the book of Acts and all throughout the New Testament, the game changer for every one is the resurrected Christ. It's the resurrection. It wasn't the virgin birth that changed Saul. It was not the crucifixion that changed old Saul. No, it was the resurrected Christ that made a difference in Saul's life. Listen. It was at that moment that Paul changed his mind about everything. I believe it was at that instant that Paul changed his mind and his attitude about God, about Jesus, and about the church. Amen. I was sharing with someone the other day, they, I know that, <laughs> I know that they probably were meaning well, they, they meant well, but this lady walked up to me the other day and she says, I've bought you something, Pastor. And she held out her hand and so I just reached out my hand and she put a crucifix in my hand. And I looked at it and I looked at her and I said, I'm sorry. I can't accept that. What? I said, my Savior not on the cross. <laughs> Hello, come on church. I can't believe you did that, Preacher. No! The world needs to understand Jesus is not a hanging on a cross. He's not in a tomb. We went again the other day, and guess what? It's still empty. <laughs> I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, guess what? 
He's always near. I'm telling you, church, it is the resurrected Christ that made a difference in Saul's life, in Paul's life. It's the resurrected Christ that's made a difference in my life. Are y'all with me so far? Something else I want you to notice here. Do you notice that Jesus said to Saul, he said, when he made this statement, he said, you haven't been persecuting the church. Saul, you've actually been persecuting me. Is that not what he said? He said, Saul, you really had not been hurting the church. Saul, you've been hurting me. Look at it. Saul, you really had not been against the church. You've not been against Christianity. You've been against me. Do you know why that's a true statement? Because the church is the body. Amen. And Christ is the head of the body. Hey, come on, I need some help this morning. I, I want you to listen very carefully now. If you've ever truly been set on fire by the Holy Spirit, that means you've seen the light of God's truth. Listen to this. And the moment you see the light of God's truth, you will no longer separate the church from Jesus. You will never, ever again separate the church from Jesus. Let me make it personal. When you give to the church, you're actually giving to Jesus. When you support your church, you're actually supporting Jesus. Jesus. When you affirm the church, you're actually affirming Jesus. When you love the church, you're actually loving Jesus. Are y'all, are, are, hey, I had an, um, an unbeliever one time years ago when I was pastoring in Baton Rouge. And I actually had a guy who said, well, pastor, if I ever have an encounter like Saul, if I ever see the light the way Saul saw the light, I'll believe it. You better be careful. Listen to me. This is for everyone. This is for somebody, and I don't know who it is, but listen to me. Be careful, because did you know that today we actually have a light that's just as bright, if not brighter, than what Saul experienced on the Damascus Road? Really? What is that light? See, Brother Rick, when somebody says, well, I just hadn't experienced that light like Saul. Well, to me, that person's telling on themselves. Because you know what we have today that's just as bright, if not brighter than what Paul experienced on the road to Damascus? We have the light of God's word. We have the light of God's holy word. Write down Psalm 119. Verse 105, listen to what the scripture says. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. It is a light unto my path. The word of God is just bright today as it was the day on the Damascus Road. Mm. That's why people don't study their Bibles the way they should. That's why we, listen, have you ever noticed 
devil doesn't want you to read the Bible. Listen to me. This book can be better <laughs> than Solomon. I can be wide awake and pick it up to read it, and all of a sudden, <sighs> I get so sleepy. You know why the devil doesn't want us to study this and read this? Because the moment you get into this book, you start studying the Word of God, it starts illuminating. And the light gets so bright, you're thinking, "Woo! ouch. It starts pointing out my sin. Hello, church. The devil will do everything he can to keep you away from this right here. Hello, amen. Have you been in it this week? Have you been studying it this week? Have you seen the light of God's truth? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The word of God is a shining light. It will be a lamp unto you in the times, the dark times in which we are living. So here's the question. Have you seen the truth of God's, have you seen the light of God's truth? Truth says, just like Saul was in need of a Savior, you're in need of a Savior. Amen. The truth says this, that Jesus died on the cross for Saul, but guess what? He died on the cross for you. The Bible says the truth of that, that Jesus is alive and you need to surrender to him this morning. I'm telling you, when you see the light, you will be on fire. When you meet the master, you will be on fire. When you have an encounter with a holy God, you can't keep on being the same way you used to be. I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of your heart, he will change you from the inside out, not from the outside in. I'm telling you, church, listen to me. When you meet the master, you will have a fire burning in you. And listen to me, you can't hide it under a bushel. No, you're going to let your light shine. Let this little light shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Woo, we ought to be singing that right now. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine all the time. You can't hide it. Amen. Listen to me. When you've been set on fire, fire everywhere you go you will be caught forth fires amen why you ought to be burning so bright that when you walk in a room everybody says whoo <laughs> amen let me remind you something I told you last Sunday fire does two things gives light, but it also puts off heat. Are you listening, church? Secondly, when you see the light, you will receive the life of God's Spirit. Once you see the light, you will receive the life of God's Saul had been blinded by the light. That's where we come, or that's where we actually get that phrase, blinded by the light. Paul's companions, they take him by the hand and they have to lead him to the city of Damascus, to the house. Isn't this interesting? Of all people, they have to take him to the house of a man by the name of Judas. 
Isn't that ironic? God tells the disciple in Damascus, by the name of Ananias, I want you to go to Saul and I want you to lay hands on Saul so that his sight can be restored. Now, can you imagine perhaps what was going through the mind of Ananias? When the Lord said, Ananias, I want you to go to a house and there's a guy there by the name of Saul and I want you to go lay hands on him so he can receive his sight. You know what I think? I think Ananias said, Are you sure, Lord? Saul the murderer? You want me to go and lay hands on that man who persecutes people? And you, you, Lord, I got a headache. <laughs> Lord, I'm not feeling too good right now. Lord, can you send somebody? Can you blame Ananias? Remember this. The Bible tells us in Galatians 1 and verse 13 that he persecuted the church of God. Listen to this. Violently. It says in Galatians 1.13, he tried to destroy you know, I was reading that, and I, and I thought, Brother Jimmy, maybe Ananias, maybe he had family, or maybe there were some friends that were either put in jail because of Saul, maybe some had even been killed because of Saul, and now you want me, Lord, to go to Saul? See, what Ananias didn't know at this moment was what the Lord had done for Saul. He just didn't know what God had done in the life of Saul. Now comes the second stage of this man that's on fire. Look at verse 17. It says, And Ananias went his way. He entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul. <laughs> I love that. Called him brother. Brother Saul. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight, watch this, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see that phrase there in that verse 17, filled with the Holy Spirit? You really ought to underline that. Because where it says, and filled with the Holy Spirit, you could actually under that write three words, set on fire. Saul was set on fire. I, I, I even wrote down beside mine the word ignited. Saul had been ignited by the Holy Spirit. Let me give you Saul's testimony. Let me summarize it like this. Here's what happened to Saul. Later changed his name to Paul. Here's what happened. Paul... He saw the light. Because he saw the light, he gained his sight. And because he gained his sight, Paul received God's might. Amen. You see the progression? He saw the light. He gained his sight. He experienced God's might. Church, listen to me this morning. Here's the difference. When you see the light of Jesus, you're going to receive spiritual sight. You're going to see things completely different. I'm telling you, when you meet the master, you're going to understand things that you didn't understand before. I have witnessed this with my own eyes. I've experienced this down through the years. Preacher, I know I'm a Christian. Preacher, I was baptized when I was nine years old. But preacher, that Bible don't mean anything to me. I read it and I read it and it just doesn't make sense. Listen, brother, I love you, but when you meet the master, when you have an encounter with a holy 
God. You'll pick up this Bible, you'll read from its pages, and all of a sudden you'll start understanding things you never understood before. What makes the difference? The Holy Spirit will illuminate the Word and all of a sudden things start coming off the pages. It will go from the page and it will leap into your heart and you'll see things and you'll understand things you didn't understand before. Woo! Y'all looking funny. It's the truth. I'm telling you, it's the truth. When you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, you're going to start understanding spiritual things. When you have a genuine encounter of the Holy Spirit, you're going to want to be a person that prays. <laughs> oh, I feel something here. When you have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, and you're called on to pray, you're not going to say, I, I pray. called on a man years ago when I was pastoring in Texas. Called on and prayed. He said, I, I passed. You what? He said, I passed. I didn't know what he meant. You pass what? Let me tell you what I thought. <laughs> well, he told me later, he said, preacher, I just don't pray in public. Really? How come? I just don't, I just don't. Then you need to meet Jesus. Y'all looking funny again. I'm telling you, when you meet Jesus, you start doing things that you never did before. Well, preacher, I just don't know how to pray. So? You know what the Bible says? We're to pray with child like babies. My children, when they were little, they just said, Daddy, I won't. <laughs> Daddy, I need. It's simple. Daddy, I'm hungry. That's all they had to say, and I knew what they needed. I'm telling you, when you meet the master, guess what? You will be a witness. You'll tell somebody about Jesus. You know why we don't tell people about Jesus? Because we don't know him ourselves. Boy, that's not a sermon that you win friends and influence people that you're good influence. You talk about what you know about. <laughs> you get around somebody that loves to deer hunt, they can talk about deer hunting all day long. You get around somebody that loves to fish, listen, they can tell you about the fish, where they were, what kind it was, the rod, the reel, the bait, the boat. Hello? They can talk to you all day long about it. Grandbabies. We can talk about our babies all day, show you pictures, tell you what they did in the third grade. Yeah, look at Miss Felicia, uh, uh, Miss Sheila back there, holding up that baby. Hold him up, hold him up, hold him up, hold him up. See that? See, see that? She's proud! proud about something, you can talk about it. Hello, church. Paul saw the light and gained the sight and received God's mind. How do we know that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit? 
You ready for this? Here's my third and final point. Watch this. How do we know that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit? Here's how we know. Watch this. Because you will share the love of God's Son. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will share the love of God's Son. Look at verse 20. Watch this. Follow along. It says, immediately he, that Saul, preached the Christ in the synagogues, and he's the Son of God. And then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priest. And Saul increased all the more in strength, and he confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. You know what I read just there? Here's what I see. Saul, who was the man of hate, now becomes Paul, a man of love. Saul, who was the man of hate, is now known as Paul, a man of love. You see, now the supreme love of his life is Jesus Christ. And you know what jumped out at me? Now that he was on fire and filled with the Holy Spirit, he actually wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. I mean, this was cool if you think about it. Saul walks into the synagogue, and everybody thought, all right, man, old Saul is here. The man that's fixing to stomp out Christianity. The man is going to silence them once and for all. So Saul walks into the synagogue, and they hand him the scriptures to read. And they probably are sitting there thinking, boy, we fix to get a scorcher. He's going to let the people of the way have it. And he stands up. What a Kodak moment. And in verse 20, here's what he said. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, risen from the dead, he is Lord. Woo! What a sermon. What a sermon. And then you know what he did? He repeated that all throughout Asia, to Ephesus, to Athens. And this man by the name of Paul, think about it. His theology has become the foundation of the church today. You know what's amazing? He never had a course in mission work. Didn't have any diplomas hanging on his wall. Never even went to a church growth seminar. Oh, my word, never even went to a seminary. He did what he did. Perhaps one of the greatest men that ever walked the face of the earth was next to Jesus. And you know why he did what he did? You know how he did what he did? Because he was a man who had been set on fire by the Holy Spirit. It's amazing what one man could do because his life was on fire by the Holy Spirit. I went to bed with that on my mind last night. Really, I'm being honest. I was, went to bed with this on my mind last night. It's 3 o'clock this morning. I woke straight up, sit up. And I'm thinking, Lord, I want to be like that. I want to be on fire. You know what the Holy Spirit reminds me? Yours, son. You just got to let it out. You 
And I said, Lord, I want Mildale to be on fire. Here's what he said. I'm telling you, at 3 o'clock, the Lord said, it can be, son. You can, son, have a church full of Pauls. There's no excuse for this church not to be on fire. There's no excuse for this church not to grow. There's no excuse for people not to be saved. No excuse for us not to have to baptize every week around here. There's no excuse. So what's wrong? How come we just have a half empty church every week? See, this right here, this congregation today, this is what I call Mildale Part 1. Now, next Sunday, Part 1 won't be here because Part 2 will be here. <laughs> I'd be glad when we get confused and all parts show up on the same Sunday. <laughs> We'd fill the place up. I told Brother Jimmy. I was talking to Brother Jimmy and Brother Danny just not too long ago. And he, you know what I told him? I said, here's the amazing thing. We'd have a church full if just our people would get faithful. Just, if our people just be faithful. Hello. I mean, here's the problem. Excuses, excuses, you hear them every day. The devil will supply them if from church you'll Stay away. A few years ago, I was in Arkansas preaching a revival. The preacher said, Brother Liz, would you go with me to the hospital? We got a lady in the hospital, and she's in bad shape. We got there. I don't know. Five or ten minutes before we got there, the lady passed away. The doctor, Fort Smith, Arkansas, pronounced her dead. Came out and shared with the family. The husband was weeping. He was just grief stricken. Can you imagine the horror when about five, ten minutes later, the nurse from the wing in charge discovered that the lady still alive. She called the doctor and said, Doc, I think you need to call the family. The doctor was embarrassed and yes, didn't know really what to say. And he called the husband and said, I need to talk to you for just a moment about your wife. And the husband, I heard that from this end, he said, what do you mean you're going to talk to me about my wife? She's dead. She died 15 minutes ago. And here the doctor embarrassed and not really knowing what to say, said, well, there's been a slight improvement. <laughs> you listen to me. Listen to me. You may be sitting here this morning. You've been a member of Milldale since 1963. You may be sitting here today and you remember somebody's church and you, why, you go back to the fact you was baptized when you were 10 years old. Now, I love you, but i got to speak truth. Can you handle it? No such thing as slight improvement. You either saved or you're not. And if you've ever been set on fire by the Holy Spirit, you can't hide the fire that's in you. Listen to me. You're either burning or you're not. You don't walk around 
keeping it here. Mm -mm. Let me tell you something. If there's a fire in you, watch this. Watch this. You watching this? If there's really a fire in you, the Holy Spirit is saying, He's fanning the flame because he's wanting the fire to get bigger. Amen. You say, well, don't you blow on it? Don't that put it out? Mm -mm. I learned from my grandfather years ago. I told you all about the one fire I built in my house this year. I had a hard time getting that thing to go. But it was amazing when I got down to <laughs> boy. Flames shot up. I love you enough to tell you the truth. There's some of you sitting here today, you're great people. You're a good person. You had an emotional experience. You're religious. either on fire or you're not. What is it? I pray for the Holy Spirit to bring conviction where conviction is needed and that the Holy Spirit will save the lost. I pastored years ago at Greenville Springs on Sunday morning. Church was packed. When the invitation was given, I saw a man start down that side aisle over there. He walked down that aisle. He turned. He come across and came to me. I reached out and called him by his name. I said, Earl, can I help you today? He said, Preacher, I'm I looked at him, I said, no, not you, your deacon, your Sunday school teacher. You're one of the most faithful people, men in this church, and tears just come. He said, yes, me. Today. like that sitting in churches all across America today. You're either on fire or you're not. Let's pray. Mm, mm, mm. No such thing as slight reproof. You're saved or you're lost. Holy Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Bring conviction to those who are religious.